The controversy surrounding the third interstellar object we've yet seen, 3i Atlas, has been marked with ambiguity. It looks like a comet, albeit a somewhat strange one compared to our solar system comets, but ultimately most of what it's doing remains within the confines of what comets can do, and not very much within what might be expected from an alien probe. After all, outgassing is not something particularly efficient for a probe, especially if that outgassing isn't really accomplishing anything except mass loss for the craft. It's basically evaporating rather than thrusting itself anywhere. But there are ways where such a probe might be completely unambiguous and exhibit behavior that comets, or anything else for that matter, simply do not. One puzzling way an object could do it is to outgas highly unusual materials. If, for example, something came through releasing radioactive isotopes, or perhaps elements it should not have, such as technetium or plutonium, then it would be difficult to make a natural case for that. A very obvious and traumatic change in direction, not accounted for by gravity, would also get our attention. But the ambiguity problem faces all of SETI in that radio signals can also be ambiguous. Take the WOW signal. It took 50 years to come up with a plausible, natural explanation for it. But once we had that, it went a long way towards settling that enigmatic signal's origin. Though not completely as the mechanism proposed. A magnetar lighting up a hydrogen cloud is in itself not a common occurrence, and we probably won't see a repeat of that for a very long time, if ever. But a radio signal can also be unambiguous. If you start seeing coherent modulation in a signal of interstellar origin, that would take things a long way in being able to determine if it was of alien origin. Likewise, a signal pulsing out prime numbers is something nature does not do. But we haven't seen anything like that. We've only seen ambiguous signals like wow. But there is a rather scary type of clear signal we could detect. And it would be if a probe entered the solar system, parked in orbit of Earth, and started releasing electromagnetic pulses, EMPs, sending us back to the Stone Age. That would be unambiguous. But there are other perhaps more spooky things that could happen. One would be a very specific kind of reconnaissance probe. We can call it a Grand Tour Probe. This borrows somewhat from Arthur C. Clarke's novel Rendezvous with Rama, where a probe enters the solar system and then leaves without paying much real attention to us. But here the probe would be timed for opportune alignments of the planets to get a complete or almost complete survey of the solar system before moving on in interstellar space perhaps onward to another star system to survey. This all goes back to the Grand Tour alignment of the 1970s and 80s, where the outer solar system was aligned in such a way that gravitational slingshotting allowed one probe, Voyager 2, to survey four planets in one shot. These kinds of alignments are rare, at least from Earth. There may be other angles, but I mention Earth because that's probably one planet aliens want to take a look at. And the next alignment of that type is about 175 years from now. But had we possessed the equipment that we have today, we might have searched during the 70s and 80s to see if anyone else was taking advantage of it and taking a survey of the solar system. One aspect here is that we launched the Voyager probes from Earth. Voyager 1 did Jupiter and Saturn, but took a detour to examine Titan. It then started its journey out of the solar system. But seeing the unbelievably mysterious moon Titan was deemed well worth it. Voyager 2, however, saw Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune in the alignment. But if an alien civilization had sent a probe from outside the solar system rather than launching from Earth, the inner planets, or at least some of them, including Earth, could have been added to the exploration roster. Knock out a survey of most of the solar system in one shot. Had we seen such a thing, it would have been unambiguously alien. Asteroids do not perform very close flybys and very accurately timed gravitational assists of multiple aligned planets. The coincidences would simply have been too great to put a natural origin on such an encounter. Where this might get spooky, however, is if the probe did that survey without ever contacting us before leaving, and we'd be left wondering what its motives were. Incidentally, any past surveys of this type, where a probe enters the solar system, looks around, and then leaves would be undetectable by us. 
We'd never know it if someone in the past did this. But the motive would remain a mystery. Was it a precursor to a future invasion? Or a mining survey, in which case our planets might end up disassembled, and so on? The ambiguity problem brings up a popular and often misquoted maxim. It's never aliens, until it is. The until it is part is where it's unmistakably alien in origin, and that can happen when detecting alien life. Now some have made the argument that it's never aliens, period. But that's unsupportable, because it requires them to prove a negative, and the speed of light prevents you from ever doing an experiment to prove it. All you can do is look and see if you get any positives that are unambiguous. Regardless of where you stand on whether there are close aliens or distant only ones or none at all, the ambiguity remains. So from this, some will say a close alien probe is unlikely, but we don't actually know what the likelihoods of alien life are and the rules it runs on. We just know that we're here and we're someone else's alien civilization. But there's another odd point here there have been a number of models, including Robin Hansen's Grabby Aliens and others, that suggest that once a civilization begins to expand in a galaxy, it expands very rapidly and soon takes over the entire galaxy, or at least until it runs to the next star empire over. This basic idea is what led Enrico Fermi to exclaim at a Los Alamos lunch, where are they? And the Fermi paradox was born. But he was right in that when you take into account that while the galaxy is vast, you can still put a probe in every star system in the galaxy inside of just a few million years at sublight speeds. This would suggest that we should be seeing aliens everywhere, if other spacefaring civilizations exist in the galaxy. We don't. At best we see ambiguity, leading to the many proposed solutions to the paradox. But we also make the assumption that we know what an advanced alien civilization looks like. Here, with the Grand Tour probe, I assumed that aliens would use physical probes in the same way we do. They may not. Again, to invoke Clark, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and it's true, but within some seeming limits, like the laws of physics. But it is true in the sense that there is no guarantee that we'd recognize the aliens, and we can come up with ways to try to envision alien technosignatures but mostly as a way of figuring out what to look for. That's the starting point. But then there are potential technosignatures that might go completely unrecognized, yet represent a monumentally highly advanced alien civilization nonetheless. One such example is a nanotechnological civilization. We are only just beginning to explore the potential of nanotechnology, essentially creating robots or computers on a nanoscale. The fact is, with the right technology, we can further miniaturize some technologies much further. This type of a civilization may exist as an artificial intelligence or uploaded civilization existing in a cloud, basically indistinguishable from normal dust in space at its most basic. The intelligence or consciousness here would be distributed across countless nanobot platforms communicating using very low power radio that you might not even detect if you are in their star system with them, much less at a distance. They might also organize as a swarm intelligence, meaning that it's possible that any one nanobot may have specialized capabilities that only work when all nanobots function as a whole. The inspiration for this is that swarm intelligence is actually something biology on Earth does. You can see it with ant colonies, birds flocking, bacterial growth to a degree, fish schooling, and so on. At its most basic, a swarm intelligence is just a population of agents, usually called voids, interacting with each other and their environment. There doesn't even have to be a centralized means of control. They just need to follow their instructions. From this emerges, much like a brain actually, a global behavior which could even be termed intelligent. For nanotechnology, this is more aptly termed swarm robotics. But the lines blur if you start adding in mind uploading and artificial intelligence emerging as more than the sum of its parts. This sort of thing is also possible to employ with genetic engineering of biological organisms, synthetic collective intelligence. While this all may seem very alien, which is the point here really, it also does derive from how life on Earth behaves, even humans. While we're autonomous, we do act collectively. When we build things like houses, we can do it. Well, aliens may as well. 
So what would such a civilization look like as a probe in our star system? The bottom line is that if it were detectable at all, it would appear as dust. Even submicron smoke-like dust moving into the solar system like a fog bank. We might eventually see some intelligent behavior from such a thing, most notably if it starts disassembling asteroids and, I don't know, Jupiter for raw materials. And we could certainly determine how large the particles are by how they absorb light, but not a lot else unless we could get samples under a microscope. But by then, it may well be too late. The only real limits nanotechnology has in disassembling and building things is heat. They can't interact so rapidly that they melt themselves. Now nanotechnology and the speed problem comes in here. It's hard to envision an entire cloud moving at 20% the speed of light. But at the same time, machines do not care about the passage of time if they are complex enough to survive indefinitely. Or alternately, you could just have one von Neumann probe that manufactures the cloud when it gets here. They could just act as tiny von Neumann probes and self-replicate, perhaps far easier than a large probe of this type could. They could go dormant in the interstellar medium and wake back up when arriving in a star system, but then rears the head of the gray goo. But I'll save that for another video. Welcome to Spooky Season 2025. Thanks for listening. I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently addressing the invisible alien nanotechnological civilization that might take us centuries to even be able to try to start trying to detect. Even more chilling is this. All you need is one civilization at some point in the history of this galaxy for them to be everywhere. And be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channel for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.